Hello, everybody, and welcome back to stage two of the Diana Initiative Virtual Conference. Woo! Um, a quick announcement for y'all. Uh, the Career Village has a raffle for some e-learn security courses. So um, please remember to stop in or to enter. Um, it is in the sessions area. Um, and uh, today we are going to be hearing from uh, Aditi, um, Aditi Bhatnagar. Um, she is a security enthusiast who is presently working as a software engineer in endpoint security, um, developing Defender solutions for Android at Microsoft. Um, she is currently involved in researching the privacy and security aspects of, evol of the evolving Android landscape and likes hacking around with tools and technologies that interest her. Um, intrigued by the numerous ways in which technology is shaping human lives and societies, she likes researching the evolving relationship between the two and uh, to share her perspective on her website, Digitize. She is an advocate of digital privacy, security, and digital well-being, and has conducted several talks and workshops to spread awareness regarding the same. Um, please uh, join me in welcoming Aditi. Woohoo! Thanks, Josh, uh, for the introduction. <laughs> yeah, hi, folks. I'm uh, Aditi. Uh, first of all, thank you, Diana Initiative, for offering such an amazing platform uh, and giving me the opportunity to talk. And it might be like really awesome to see all of you uh, in real time, but uh, never mind. We will do a decent job here in network after this. So, uh, yeah, so the topic for today is really interesting um, hacking into Android apps. Um, disclaimer, first thing first, it, it's my opinion and not of my employers, essentially. And one of the good things about the talk is that it's happening at a really good time. For the last, uh, uh, I mean, in the recent uh, times, Microsoft has announced support for different platforms like Linux, Android, iOS. We are essentially, we are taking Microsoft Defender so uh, to, to the other platforms. So uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm working on the Android thing and it's very exciting for me to talk on this particular topic here. Um, so let's let's talk about Android. Um, so before jumping into the technical details, let's talk a little bit about the market study because it's very interesting when it comes to Android and creating defender solutions for Android. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of us uh, who are on this call right now and will be watching this uh, might have used Android already because we have like 2.5 billion devices, more than 2.5 billion devices active there. And if you look at the distribution, it's very like very diverse. So it's like Android 1.5, Android till Android 10, and now Android 11 is coming up. And there are a lot of devices which are active, not just on Android 10, but also on 9 and 8 and lower than that. So yeah, it'd be a good thing to know which one do you have. So oftentimes when I ask this question, uh, especially in the non-tech forums, uh, people are usually not aware of it. So it's, it's a good show of hands kind of question so that you get to know in the audience how many are Android fans there. Uh, and the market distribution, as we say, it's like a segmented market. And why it's, impo it's important is that it offers a very unique uh, problem to solve uh, when it comes to defending it. because. People are, are there on different platforms. So it's not a clear cut thing that, okay, build this thing in this one. You don't know how many people use the previous platforms. So you have to uh, build a solution in such a way that those platforms are protected as well. And to top that, Android is not just uh, in a one particular OEM, right? It doesn't only ships with Pixel. Uh, it comes like, it's open to anyone to adopt. So they are like, uh, we have different OEMs. We have Samsung, Oppo, Motorola, all of them on Android. And what happens is that they add their own OEM specific layer on top of it. So uh, that also adds uh, different kind of things to the design, uh, which offer different set of challenges. Because oftentimes it can happen that even if the bugs is not in uh, Android, there is some uh, vulnerabilities on that extra layer which are exploited and targeted for that OEM specific person, uh, OEM specific uh, device. So let's talk about the security patches thing. Again, this is one interesting thing. Uh, it's always recommended that you keep on updating your Android mobiles because uh, the security patches are supported only for so much time. So it's like, uh, fixed number of years, and after that, the support is not there. So uh, a lot of people who are still on the older versions are still vulnerable, uh, and there's nothing much that you can do in that domain. So that offers another challenge in defending Android ecosystem. So these are just slides uh, showing the numbers of uh, some supports, uh, which I pulled up from the links uh, from the vendors. So these are the challenges, and this is how the overall segmentation looks like. Um, 
And let's talk about the Android threat landscape now, having talked about the segmentation. So since when have we started seeing Android and how it has evolved over years? So uh, we'll talk from 2010, because the numbers was, uh, was really low at that time. And then from there, it has just boomed. So in 2010, uh, the numbers were around 26 plus 4. Major vectors has been around sideloading uh, from arbitrary websites. So if you don't go to the recommended uh, source to download, you're not going to play store to download, which is trustworthy. If you're downloading it from some website or side loading it, there are large way uh, like it, there are very high chances that it is a vulnerable. It can be a potential exploit. So uh, and a lot of these have come through uh, those channels. Uh, so back then in time, it was like premium SMS trojans and spywares that were popular. Then we see that it was 2011, uh, we started getting routing trojans. Then we started getting spywares and adwares around 2012. In 2013, there was a hit in financial malware, uh, banking uh, malware, premium SMS, which went really viral in uh, amongst the researchers. Uh, and then 2014, it was, again, the same set of things, but the number is higher. And it goes on and on and on. Uh, in 2015, the firm firmware uh, level of things started getting exploited. So uh, that was there. And what's interesting, in 2018, we started having coin miners uh, leading to the Bitcoin uh, adoption and mining thing. We'll talk about it a little bit uh, in a little bit. So uh, that is the evolution that keeps on happening across the years. Um, and how do they infect? Essentially, as we talked about the third party app stores uh, driven by downloads, you go to a website, you just download it from the APK file and you mistakenly installed it. Uh, side loading, uh, trojanized apps, uh, the apps look good, but then they are doing some malicious things in the background through either no knowingly or unknowingly, they might have third party libraries which are doing it or they themselves do it. So uh, that is there, then firmware trojans, uh, aggressive ads, hijackers. And sometimes it really it happens that even in the official store, the app was malicious and then it, uh, it is caught later and removed from the store. So those are the infection channels. Uh, this is again some uh, basic stats to get that overview right. Um, the 2020 thing is still growing. So it's just August 21st, uh, where we are sitting on 2.28 million uh, of uh, Android malwares and 2.48 million of PUA. PUA stands for potentially unwanted apps. So what are some prominent attacks in Android? Like what, if you think about it, how can, what all can you do from Android? Uh, so one thing that you have to keep in mind in studying all these attacks is that it's a very personal thing. It's your own device. So a lot of personal information can be there. So. So when it comes to spying, uh, for whatever reasons, it, Android makes a good uh, platform to be exploited uh, to the hackers. Uh, similarly, it's like uh, the breadth of things is a lot. So there's a lot of devices. Now, uh, that gets involved in when you have, say, DDoS attack or botnet kind of thing, because the number of devices that we have is huge. So those are the things that come uh, when we talk about the prominent attacks here. Uh, so talking about banking malware, uh, banking malware is essentially, as the, as the name uh, looks like, it is something which is doing fraudulent transactions. So basically, it takes your credentials and then does a transaction from your end. And how it exactly did it back in time. Uh, so it started a malicious demo service and silently monitors all the apps that victim open. So back then we had this permission in Android where you can get all the current permissions, which uh, all the current applications which are uh, active, which the person is looking at. So you can get the exact app that the person is looking at. And then what this malware did was put up a prompt on top of that app asking for, suppose your credit card details or whatever. So so it looks like from the user perspective, it looks like it's coming from the app because as a user, you have no clue that there's a background service which is popping up this particular uh, thing. So uh, so that used to happen, but then there's a question that how was the two-factor authentication handled? Because it's not just you know me entering the credentials, you, you need another factor as well. So for that, uh, they added uh, access to the SMS permission SMS storage, they were able to read the SMS. They also deleted the SMS once they have read the value. Uh, for, for the cases where the OTP or two-factor authentication was coming through voice calls, they added a forwarding service by, by using USSD codes and then getting the OTP. So uh, those kind of things happened. And, and, and additional uh, things that were interested there was like, they added this code to neuter all the calls if the victim is trying to contact the helpline. So even that won't go away. So it's like, 
what all you can imagine uh, a simple app sitting on your um, android can do uh, to try to use all those things to get <clears throat> fraudulent transactions from victims we have so and i mean the incoming alerts were muted and this was actually a very big thing a 25 million usd heist uh, happened because of this malware uh, and here is something that i recreated um, on the basis of how basically it worked so if you can see i'll just fast forward it because I didn't speak it out. But if you see the list of this, uh, com.android.vending, uh, this is basically the package name. So every, uh, every app sitting on your device has a unique package name. Um, and uh, it gives all the package names that, that you have to listen to. So here, what happened was like, I'm listening to com.whatsapp, uh, one of the package names. And when I click on WhatsApp, after some time, you see this prompt comes up on top of it. So you'll see that enter your credentials, Google Play, card number, some things I filled in. So this is basically now it looks like, you know, WhatsApp is asking me, and suppose it's not WhatsApp, but it's some paid service, some paid game or something, it will appear very genuine. And there are high chances that uh, the user will end up entering the credentials here. So this was a basic way in which it was used to uh, harvest the credentials. Uh, then let's talk about ransomware, a very popular term uh, in InfoSec. There are uh, usually two types of ransomware. One is crypto ransomware, the one is locker ransomware. Crypto is the one which encrypts your whole data sitting on the device um, and then you know hides the key or asks money in return of the key. The locker ransomware is the one which basically comes on top of the screen, making the user uh you know the user just cannot do anything uh not letting the person operate on the device so it just is there on top of the screen and you cannot do anything there so it's kind of locker ransomware and these the second kind is very popular in android how does it get on your phone again through downloading contents and some social engineering tricks this this, uh, this kind of thing is kind of common so we can go past it but yeah one interesting case here was like uh the boing app case so now it, it's like it's uh, interesting how they play with the psychology of the users so what this particular ransomware did was uh it came on top of the screen and then it told users that you have accessed some links or you have viewed illegal content and you have to pay money uh, so it's like your police is charging money and uh again like buying into that thing a user and ended up paying money on that so here is uh, one demo on how ransomware usually looks on Android. So this is censored app is the demo app. So here it's like this is a screen where it's asking for some money. I mean, pay here, Bitcoin or wallet address is usually provided. And then you do the transaction and give some code. And until you do it, it just keeps on appearing. No matter whether you go back, you restart the device or you know, you try different ways of getting out of it. It's just stuck there. So uh, that is what it looks like. Let's go to the uh, next thing, which is coin miner. Uh, so again, like uh, coin mining needs a lot of compute, and uh, hackers have already realized it obvious, for obvious reasons. So they have distributed the thing. So it's like uh, there are apps on your device which are trying to process, trying to do uh, heavy processing jobs uh, and uh, leading to mining coins. Um, and rather than get and the device owner getting the money, uh, it just gets transferred to the Bitcoin of the hacker. So that happens in coin mining. It happens sometimes through apps. Other times it happens even through uh, JavaScript libraries. Most of the things I think in this area is fixed. So uh, JavaScript libraries, it's like you are accessing a web page, and through that web page itself, it is um, mining, performing the mining jobs. So why do you care? Uh, because in some cases, it's illegal, uh, depends. Uh, then your compute power is exploited. Mobile is already limited resource thing. And if you perform high intensive job, it will be exploited. And uh, you cannot use basically that power for your own valid uh, needs. And eventually, the device will wear and tear fast, and uh, you would need to replace the hardware. So it is a concerning thing. Another kind of thing that we have seen is surveillance where, as we talked about privacy on Android, uh, there are like a lot of uh, cases of spywares uh, being used for different reasons. So surveillance where one interesting one, which I read about, it's a report by Lookout. Uh, it is Monocle mobile surveillance where, and it was kind of doing everything it could have done to get maximum details. So I, there are like things like remounting the system partition to install attacker certificate or keylogger, obviously making calls, recording calls. Then location is a very interesting factor when it comes to Android, um, retrieving browser history, 
uh, another interesting thing was like all the popular dictionary terms. So whatever you type on your keyboard, which is a common thing across all the apps, uh, it was able to get a dictionary of uh, all the popular uh, frequently typed uh, terms and then uh, know what the person is talking about. Similarly, taking screenshots or taking photos. So uh, that is about surveillance sphere and a less intrusive version of that is a stalker where which is usually far misused in domestic violence. And uh, in fact, nowadays there are like a lot of apps which are coming up for tracking uh, children in a school or different ways. I think there are a lot of ethical debates and privacy rights involved there that need to be discussed. And this issue is still open there. Another thing is phishing attacks. Uh, now what's interesting in phishing attacks is that they, it's a lot of user context is involved in phishing attacks. So I'll, I'll share a brief story about an auto guy. So for those who don't know what an auto is, auto is basically a very popular. So I am speaking from India. And uh, here it's like a popular transport vehicle. Uh, it has three wheels and are pretty affordable. So we have like a whole set of people who, who earn low incomes and they uh, have taken up uh, the auto driving profession. So um, so I was, I was using that transportation mode to go somewhere and I asked the person to just stop and let me collect my parcels which were coming from some e-commerce sites. So uh, the person asked me that, uh, he asked if it's in Hindi of course, but uh, he asked that, ma'am, is it okay if I buy this thing from say a particular website? Uh, and it was a very renowned website. So I said, yeah, of course you can go ahead and buy it. But that, then he said that it's, it's like a 17K mobile that he's getting in 4K. And then I got suspicious. I was like, how, where did you get the information from and he showed me a popular popular uh, chat app and there was like a proper group created with a profile a big change to that company's logo and there were like a lot of schemes going in there and the url was just you know um exactly the same as uh, as the original uh, company's url but just one extra character added so now here the problem comes of not just tech literacy but also uh, you know english is not the native language of that person the person won't know the spelling of it it's very uh, I mean, fair to assume. And that way, if you are um, asking the person to remember that, because for those who are fluent in a particular language, it's fine. But if you are not, then remembering it's a, a different task. And their assumptions can roll in uh, more. So that was a thought provoking thing for myself. And already it's like the person is earning low and then they're exploited more on the tech literacy basis. So it's a very interesting point that we have the Android outreach to a lot of people, uh, but not all of them are uh, you know, uh, have that digital literacy which is needed. So uh, apart from the industry giving the solutions, uh, this thing has also is, should be addressed from user uh, perspective was the thought that I had. Um, so having talked about all of that, let's get into the most exciting part, which is reversing Android apps. So I'm uh, assuming that we don't know anything about Android. So we'll do a quick uh, walkthrough through what an app is, how it looks like, and what all is there, and the platform architecture. So Android apps are usually coded in Java and Kotlin. And uh, as you know, Java, it compiles to bytecode. Uh, the platform structure uh, architecture looks like this. Uh, we have the app sitting on the top. Then we have Java API framework. Then the interesting thing is that we can also add C and C++ code in the same Android app. Uh, so there is a thing, JNI, which is used to uh, interface both of them. Uh, that they work together. And we have Android runtime and hardware layer. And then uh, towards the uh, lowest thing, we have the Linux kernel, uh, SE Linux. So that is how it looks like. Um, the architecture and everything is sandboxed. So every app, is, app has its own uh, UID and group ID. Uh, every app has its own files uh, is stored in a particular location, which is not accessible to the other file. Uh, the permissions are handled in a very interesting way, which I was reading at last. So it's like you have, in the end, you have like group IDs, the same way it happens in Linux, but uh, how the permission uh, from Java gets all the way to the kernel was interesting to know. So it's like end up uh, in group ID. I think what will be interesting to study here would be uh, with the revamped permission model, how, how does that file basically changes? Um, so yeah, typical components of the app is, app, no, app is not exactly a process. Uh, an app can be triggered or brought into the background, uh, into the foreground through a lot of ways. Um, so we have activity. So whenever you use an app, whatever comes on your screen is an activity, it can be treated as an activity. So every new screen, uh, for starters, you can assume that, okay, it, it is an activity. There are more details to it, but for the first understanding, we can have that assumption. Then service is something which is already always running in the background. 
and doing jobs, just like in our uh, banking malware, it was showing up a pop up, right? So it was a service which is running in background, looking at what is happening in the pool run, and then popping up that dialog box. Then we have receivers, which is broadcast receiver. Basically, uh, if the internet has gone, uh, the apps need to know, right? If internet is is not available or if a wi-fi is available i can do a download so app uh, needs all that information and it comes to the app in the form of system broadcasts so a battery has been plugged in or the internet has changed uh, so those kind of things come in a receiver um, you can put receivers for a lot of things a new app got installed etc content provider is essentially sharing information within the app and across the app it can be files or database or whatever needs to be shared so those are the components and uh, this file is the most interesting the right one which is the manifest so whenever you reverse uh this is the first thing i do i, I just look at the manifest because it has all the uh, major things it has the application structure uh, it has all it has listed all the permissions that the app is using which gives you good clues into what the app is intending to do or where all it will affect potentially it has uh, all the different uh, components defined within application uh, tags so we have provider, receiver, service, and activity. And there are many more uh, things to it. These are just for starting up. And briefly about how the project is arranged. Uh, basic folders, we have manifest. We have ja all the Java files in Java. Apart from the codes, we also have resources. So we'll have things like you know your layout designs, uh, which are in XML, your images uh, or media that you have included, which is, again, in resources. You can add things explicitly in assets. And then overall, in the end, towards the end, you'll have Gradle scripts to have this all compiled and running. So yeah. So that is the basic project structure. Um, And once you've coded uh, the app and built the app, then what happens? Uh, again, quickly walking through it because uh, it'll help when when you when you talk about the reversing of the Android app. So you have application resources which are compiled using AAPT, so um, and gets into compiled resources. You have the main code files which are compiled into dot class files uh, using Java compiler, and then you use text to compile it into dot text file. Um, and then you have the IDL files as well in, in the apps, which actually use Android interface defi uh, definition language. But usually, they are in, in normal apps are not similar. So all of them get compiled uh, into uh, the resources. And then you have APK Builder, uh, which does uh, which produces a single APK, which has all of these there. And then you further have a jar signer to sign that APK. And zip align, uh, find the release. The APK. That is how the whole build process goes in general. Um, the interesting thing is that Java, uh, just putting it again, it's like not platform dependent, right? So that and that gives a lot of ease while reversing because uh, if it's the C thing, it's like directly compiled into a platform specific thing. Um, in Java, you have bytecode, which is comparatively more readable when it comes to uh, disassembling and seeing it. So you coded the app and built next. Okay, this is the same thing basically. So we just talked about it, and we talked about how uh, it's relatively easy than reversing the native apps. So let's go in reverse. So what I have done here is that it is a sample app, a sample APK uh, which I created, and I'm putting it into the uh, app. Now uh, we have built the app. We have put it in the app uh, in, in the Android, right? Now what I'm trying to do is pull this APK and see what all is there in the APK. So basically, there, uh, there are tools to do that. Uh, here I have installed it. So this is the app. This is the person meditating. And now I'll pull it. So there are uh, commands for that. Uh, EDB is a very interesting thing uh, whenever you come to Android. It is Android Debug Bridge. And it has a lot of power. So if you are connected to EDB, you can do whatnot. You can screen the card. You can execute a lot of commands. Um, it's, like, it's really interesting. Whenever I read more about it, I get something new. So ADB is a really interesting thing to me still. And uh, uh, there are ADB commands to do the same, to pull the APK. Uh, so when we do ADB shell, we basically get into the shell of that emulator. So I'm running this in emulator. Uh, and once I get into the shell, I can check for the path of, of that particular app. So we use package names. So I put ADB shell PM path and the package name. And that returns me the path of the package. So it's basically the exact location where the package is living on the device. And then what you do is ADB pull and give the path. So once you have done it, um, 
yeah so here i've pulled it right and then uh, the thing about apk is it's just a zipped thing basically so when you unzip it you see a lot of things so i did unzip base.apk base.apk is a file that i pulled out of the system and so what i see is that this particular view right so you see android manifest.xml you see base.apk uh, oh that was already there in the directory please ignore it uh, there are classes or decks which are the bytecodes uh talbic bytecodes and then you have resources and some other properties associated with it so uh, this simple information you can get just by pulling out the apk and then unzipping it uh, that is the first thing and then we still have text, right? So we don't see the code yet. So how can we see the code? Uh, there are decompilers. Jadex is one of the best uh, open uh, free tool, uh, I'd say free tool. Uh, and it, it actually does a lot of decompiling. So you can see that I just, what I've done here is that is the Jadex uh, GUI. I just put the APK file here, which I pulled in the last slide and it will decompile. It will get decompiled and you can actually see the whole Java code. So it's as simple as that. If there is no obfuscation and if the code is fairly simple, just like the app I coded. So uh, so yeah, there's like properly uh, coded thing that you can read through. You have all the things, resources and everything. So basically the whole project structure which we just went through gets created by putting the APK in this JEDX GUI. But there are things when uh, JetX will fail to, do, to decompile properly, then what do you do? So there are a lot of different tools. Uh, we are just talking about a few of them in this uh, talk. But uh, we can then check uh, the tools at disassembly level, which is uh, basically Smalley and Paxmolly is a disassembler. So we can use Paxmolly and see uh, what is happening. Uh, it is not as readable as this Java file, but uh, it is still manageable and it has much better details uh, and things so uh, let's talk about pax molly a little bit because it's interesting so to the right what you see is a snippet of how pax molly code looks like um things might look a little weird here but uh, it's like it's kind of you'll get a hang of it uh, looking at it it's doing basic things um like you have you're defining variables you're defining parameters and then you are making assigning values basically calling functions and stuff so um, a clear mapping of it is available on that there are a lot of uh, amazing resources where we can see what an exact java function will get mapped to in uh back smally and for uh in smally group and for uh i think our purpose our app is fairly straightforward so we should be able to learn things from that small group so here, uh, this is uh, another thing uh, where we'll be talking about Pax Molly. Uh, so having done the JEDX, where we decompiled the app and saw the contents, uh, we now want to know uh, more about it. So what all can we do from Smalley level, not just the JEDX thing? So here, um, it's an APK again. Let's see, and let's walk through the demo and I'll, I'll just add information as we go. So I install the APK, I install here. This is the app. This is the app, which is the truth. So when I do get status, it says the world is recovering from pandemic situation, which is the truth. So this is the nature of the app, which it just, when I click on a button, it gives me a dialog saying the world is recovering from the pandemic situation. Now I'll use APK tool, uh, which is another uh, tool available out there to do this decompiling. It, it supports a lot of different things. Uh, Pax Molly thing is one of that. So it can decompile your APK and it outputs it. Uh, this is what we are doing in this command. We are decompiling, uh, decoding the APK and putting the output in out APK folder. Uh, so this is the file uh, which got generated from that command uh, using APK tool. And now this is a back small code, right? So if you see, it is like uh, methods are defined, different methods are defined, static constructors. V here is basically the white, white uh, the return type. And you have different invoke direct and different kind of commands uh, to do certain kind of things. So if you look at it, you can make sense of it. So see, the world is recovering from pandemic situation. This is the one string which it is returning. We're not doing very, very major thing here. That is not the uh, planned 
aim goal of this uh, demo but we want to do some change so we want to tweak the behavior uh, by changing the code and then see how it looks like and we have to do this tweaking in the small world so that is the goal so we find out which where is the string which is uh, being returned to us and i want to do a change there uh oh i Just give me a second, I think something went wrong here. Yeah. Hmm. So this is the string that was returned and I, I thought, let me just change it and for that, which it is as easy to patch this code that we're doing. Um, so when I do this and I do apk2 b out apk, the, which is a folder which is having this, So we get the APK back. I've done the change, so we get the APK back. But the point is that this is still unsigned because we have just patched it. So we need to sign it. And then there are a lot of jar signers available, which you can use to sign the APK. Anyone can sign the APK until it, it's trying to update the same file, I think. So yeah, so you can create your own signatures. Um, and I signed the APK then. And now I'll try to install it. So after resigning, when I go and I, okay, I have to install the previous app and then I, I'll install the new app. And then when I go now and click at it, we'll, you'll see that the string has changed. So kudos, that was first small hack into back smally. Uh, the more I think you look at the code, you'll get more understanding. That's something that I'm myself working on. But yeah, it's fun to see this thing working um, eventually. Okay. So that was another demo on how Wax Molly works. And then, then comes Twitter, which is another very interesting thing that I am excited about uh, these days a lot. So which is uh, essentially altering the code dynamically. So what we did just now was statically altering the code, right? We just changed the code, and then it got changed. But what happens in Frida is like next level. And Frida is available for a lot of platforms. I was trying out for Android. And in Android, also, there's a lot of uh, functionalities which I have explored yet but this is the basic thing which i did um so i'm, I'm hoping like uh, a lot of you have would have heard or experimented with it um so i tried for android and in android it's like a client server model kind of thing so you if you start a server in the emulator of the device so that you can uh, connect with it and give commands to it so we install a frida server we go to the frida site we install frida server we set it up um giving these permissions so it's like well documented online uh, but apart from that, you also need to uh, do some setup on the uh, laptop on which you're doing. So once you have set up the emulator or device with the FIDA server, uh, you go to the laptop and then uh, you basically install FIDA platform tools. So FIDA platform tools uh, are needed to communicate to the server, which is already there in the client. Uh, and you can check whether the connection has been established or not between the two using FIDA PS. Uh, dash u command so it will tell you whether your server is able to communicate and once the connection has happened boom you can do a lot of things now let's hey, see what uh, yeah. i'm giving you your 15 minute warning i'll get off oh. the stage oh thank you so much so um so that is there we have established the server and client thing now uh, this is a cool app uh, we would have heard about biometric right like you Basically, in Android, you have that fingerprint sensor now, which you can use to unlock. So I tried experimenting with that. And basically, can I get into the app even if my biometric thing has not passed using Frida? So this is a small uh, hack for that. So what we do here is that the first thing that I have done is see that the emulator is having Frida server. So I have done all the steps in the previous slide. I installed Frida into the device and I gave it the right executional uh, right permissions to execute and then I run the server. Uh, and once I have set up the server, I check on the uh, on the system whether I'm able to do that Frida PSU command. So basically, this will return all the active processes on your uh, emulator or device. And I'm seeing a list of them as I run that. There we go. So once we have all the processes, uh, let's start writing something. So uh, Frida allows of dynamic injection into the app code. So basically, you can dynamically change uh, the 
execution flow of a particular method. So you're not actually changing the app code itself, but you are in injecting some extra script that you want to run instead of the code that app is running. Uh, so what we do here is that I'm trying to create a script here, as you can see in the first terminal on top. So for what we are first doing is we import Frida. Uh, then we do device Frida dot get device. Uh, so basically, when you do ADB devices, you see all the devices connected. So the get device, uh, the argument to get device is one of the devices that you want to establish uh, the session with. So once you have the device, uh, then you establish a session. Uh, on that device, which app do you want to hook to? Because you need to uh, provide that, right? So this particular uh, app name is uh, what I have provided in device or attach, line number four. And then we check that the session is established. Um, now it's time to write the script. So the script is in JavaScript, uh, which is eventually converted and injected by Frida. So uh, what the JavaScript is trying to do here is uh, what I did was basically hooking on to the callbacks. So we get the method name, which we want to change. And then we change the name of that, uh, the function of that method. So let me pause here one second. OK, so this is a JavaScript. Um, function hook is the function that we want to perform uh, dynamically load. And inside that function, uh, what I'm doing is, first of all, getting the class. Uh, where CLS class is basically uh, in the app. So you need to have basic information about how the app is structured so that we can get using jet, uh, JetX that we just talked about, get the APK, see what, uh, what classes are there. And you'll get a uh, basic insight of how the uh, activities are and which activity will have the method of your interest, right? So once you have figured that out, you put the class in that, uh, and you put the class dot, uh, on authentication field is basically the method name, and then dot implementation uh, is call success. So call success is a JavaScript function. So in the CLS dot on authentication field dot implementation, now I can put in my own implementation. That is what the line is trying to do. So what we do now is that we have uh, added the JavaScript. We create the script using session.create script. And now the only thing which is left is load the script. But before loading, let's see the behavior of the app to know that it, okay, it worked. right? So um, what the app is, uh, it's a bank app, and it says authenticate to login. And whenever I click on authenticate to login, it's it's because it's an emulator. There are like different fingers set up for the login. Uh, finger one is the actual code, and all the other fingers are basically false code. Um, so when I touch the sensor using finger five, it's saying not login. And in bank, you cannot sign in. You cannot see eventually what's your bank account details, right? But when I click on finger one, it will log in and show me the bank screen. So this is what is happening before injecting the script. We have just created the script right now in Frida. And now let's load the script in Frida. So once I run this command, the script is loaded. So now the, the behavior of the app has, it will reflect. Uh, it has dynamically changed to take up that script into action. So now when I do login and I go to finger five and I do touch sensor, boom. Don't look at the login not recognized. Look at the back end, right? So this activity has changed. It's like the actual activity which had the bank details has come up, and uh, we have successfully bypassed the authentication. What I've done here is basically not hooking into the uh, biometric details of the system because it's very much hardware specific. I was interested in the callbacks that I get. So because whenever it's successful, I'll get a callback on success on authentication successful. And if it is failed, I get on authentication failed. So what I've done in the JavaScript is that even on the callback of failed, I call uh, the successful method. So whatever happens when I get a success uh, is what I'm doing when I get a failure callback uh, while putting finger five. So that was the small uh, demo on Frida. It's, it's like an amazing tool. Uh, and there's so much to explore, uh, which is in my to-do list as well. So any of you have ideas, let, let's do it. So it's, Really awesome. I like it. So uh, I talked, talked about the dynamic altering of the code. Uh, this is, again, briefly on, uh, touching upon what kind of uh, different securities and vulnerability issues, issues are there. So one of that, which we saw, was like code tampering or reverse engineering, which we just touched upon. There are a lot of different things. Uh, the first one is like impro improper platform usage. So we provided you methods for doing A, but you are doing everything 
apart from it, right? So you, you are misusing the method, basically. And this is another uh, interesting demo that I created on a strand hog vulnerability. Um, so it was revealed by Pramon in December 2019. And I read this study pretty detailed, and I tried to create it up uh, on my own. So what happens in this is there's a concept of task affinities. Uh, OK, let me brief you, I think. Yeah, it should be doable. So I'll take one minute and brief you on task affinities. Um, all of us use chat apps, right? I think WhatsApp or whatever chat app you use. So whenever you go and click on uh, add phone, uh, add contact, you'll see that the phone contact screen occurs on top of WhatsApp, right? So it's like it's basically a single task, and all of these screens get stacked on top of each other. So when we say add contacts, it doesn't take you to the contacts app. It, it's actually building on top of WhatsApp app because there are task affinities defined. So now if you don't add the contact and close the app, but when you still click on WhatsApp without like destroying the app, if you click on WhatsApp, you'll see the contact screen. So basically, they keep a stack of which one is the top activity and which different app is it referring to, right? They could have drawn it on a whiteboard. Never mind. But uh, I hope it's clear. Um, so. Let's see, and then uh, maybe I'll add a little bit more details. So what's happening in this demo is um, there's an app that I created. I call it system support so that it's convincing. And then we have uh, another app, which is Katana. Dot, so it's like Facebook. Um, now, what is happening here is, if you notice, what, what do you expect when you click on Facebook? That Facebook will open up, right? But here, if I'm clicking on Facebook, I first open my system support app, which is this view, which is sign in, email, password. Imagine it in your mind that it's looking like Facebook because I really couldn't um, get the time to fake that page. Uh, but imagine it's looking like Facebook. And now when you go to Facebook, um, it is actually opening that app, right? So this is happening because of task affinity. And it's an open and doable thing. Uh, and it's being exploited. So if you see, it's like a different kind of phishing, a very platform specific phishing uh, that you click on an app and then my app comes up and it looks like Facebook. Uh, don't go by the uh, app name. I'm not really interested on that. But yeah, uh, it, it like it, it basically looks like that. And it, it can ask you a lot of permissions, right? It will ask all the permissions, send your data, do whatever malicious act it wants to do. And, do, and then it will again target you back to the original app, and you would have no clue. So they have a really nice video put up online uh, where this is actually happening, and they're able to harvest all the credentials, and users are clueless. Cool. I think we are running short on time. Uh, I'm just sharing my excitement on Android 11, uh, which is being rolled out. There are a lot of cool privacy security features introduced, like scope storage, revamped permissions, location sharing, and a lot more. So that's all I had. Uh, yeah, and if you have any questions or doubts, or you want to have a chat to this or right now, uh, please ping me. I'd be available. I'd be around. So yeah, that's all. Thank you so much for listening. Wow! Yeah. Holy crush! <laughs> that was amazing. Um, there is so much in there. Um, yeah, um, you do have a few questions from. <laughs> Let me read those here. So Vanit asks, um, does uh, like passwordless access to a device uh, help you break into your devices? Um, sorry, I didn't get you, Josh. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, I didn't get what access exactly. Oh, so um, does passwordless access, like uh, um, uh, passwordless turned on in uh, Android, uh, does that help or hinder an attacker? Yeah, I think it can, for sure. I mean, you can automate a lot of things if you have a list of passwords. Yeah, you can go ahead and try out. I still didn't get the sense of it. So if there's more context, maybe I can add. But if what I understand is right, uh, yes, uh, definitely, it can help. Got and it. Uh, we have a really amazing thing in Android, which is accessibility <coughs> service, which can automate a lot of things. So yeah, if you have that permission, you can do whatever you want on Android. It's like super powerful. Got it. Um, Vanit, if you want to add more context in the chat, I will grab it. Um, next question. Um, Alyssa asks, um, do these Android ransomware samples also attempt to spread like worming, such as through phishing a victim's contacts, or are they typically single infections? So typically single infection, because it's like uh, once they don't perform any act, that is what was seen, that once they have locked, they are not functioning anything, and they're not letting the user do anything. So it's usually targeted, is what I've seen. Got it. 
Um, and uh, Brianna asks, uh, a lot of people use open source app stores such as F-Droid. Um, how do you balance a desire for an open ecosystem with the risks associated with it? Um, what I do is actually reverse CFK before I install something. Uh, so because there is a lot of risk, of course. Uh, but one thing, a uh, basic thing to do would be like the permissions that it's asking and the utility of it. It's a very basic check. Like someone is asking, some app is asking a lot of permissions. It's not even using. It's like a clear indicator that something is going wrong. Uh, and Honestly, like one thing would be like you, can, you cannot trust. It's it's as equivalent to installing, uh, you know, downloading executables from unknown sources on web. It's like the comparison is the same. So, don't trust. Uh, check for permissions. They were engineer if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> that was all the questions I had. Thank you so much, Aditi. That talk was amazing. Um, and uh, let's have a round of applause. Virtual round of applause. Woo! All right. Um, thank you so much, and um, have a great rest of your day, uh, audience and Aditi. Um, yeah, we'll sign off. Yeah, bye-bye.